The organ is an instrument inextricably associated with Christian churches. In the United States, its cultural livelihood is connected to the well-being of churches, their attendance, their financial health, their ability to hire talented organists, and their willingness to take care of expensive instruments. Declining trends of belief and practice for mainline Protestant and Catholic Christians, the denominations most likely to support the organ, are negatively affecting the organ in the United States. In this short video, I first present some data and analysis of changing religious belief and practice and how it is affecting the organ. Next, I introduce some examples of former churches that have organs in the United States. And finally, I advocate that we take action to bring the organ to a wider audience in secular society and present some ideas for how that might be done. While some of these ideas may be valuable elsewhere, this presentation is intended for and is about the United States. General social survey data indicates that self-reporting of no religion in the United States, indicated by the red line, has been in a steep climb since 1991. This is confirmed by a similar survey conducted by the Pew Research Center, which shows the same trends in a shorter period. For the organ, data about belief is less telling than data about religious attendance. General social survey data indicates that Americans who respond that they never attend religious services, again the red line, has significantly increased since the early 1970s. Starker than these two general trends are generational differences. Over time, the age group 18 to 34 has increasingly indicated that they never attend religious services, again indicated in red. While it is tempting for some to hypothesize that younger people may follow the cultural trope of returning to religion following an exploratory period in young adulthood, there is no data to indicate that this will happen more frequently than in the past. Absent a large-scale cultural change, it is extremely unlikely that any of these trends will reverse. Some of the harsh realities exposed by this data has led some denominations in the U.S. to fairly question whether they will continue to exist. Nevertheless, religion has historically found ways of enduring. Rather than sound the death of mainline Protestant and Catholic churches in the U.S., I argue that in their internal landscape is changing, and that more generally Christians are becoming a smaller percentage of the general American population. While there are other factors like the decline of classical music more broadly, the organ has an additional obstacle, that is, the organ is also affected by religious change. While worship attendance and religious adherence are telling, a more direct measurement of the health of the organ itself can be seen in decreases in college enrollment. Numbers of college organ majors in the United States at National Association of Schools of Music Accredited Institutions have been consistently on the decline since at least 2004. The data does not include numerous schools that have organ programs that are not accredited under this organization, such as the Juilliard School, the Curtis Institute of Music, Ivy League schools, and several others. This data also does not account for those that study the organ outside of a major. Furthermore, we know that a significant portion of both professional and amateur organists in the U.S. were not college organ majors. Nevertheless, this data is telling as it pertains to the health of a profession, and it shows a significant decline. I contend that the decline of college-level organ study is related to the decline of mainline Protestant and Catholic denominations. It is likely that most students found their start on the organ because of the church where they grew up. Although the hypothesis that most students start the organ because of relationships with the local church needs to be confirmed, a survey of undergraduate organ students conducted in 2006-2007 by Patrick Hawkins is highly suggestive that there is a link. The underappreciation of the organ in society that has been perceived by many is frequently cited as coming from the rise of praise music. Many people have their own complex and refined arguments for why changing tastes are the reason for the decline of the organ. Catholics, for instance, often cite Vatican II as the introduction of alternatives to the organ that have led to its demise. While these arguments are often salient, they are not the root of the problem. All of this put simply, Fewer and fewer people are going to churches, so fewer and fewer people hear the organ, and finally, fewer and fewer people learn how to play the organ. I think that we can have the best of both worlds. That is, we can build and sustain music programs at churches, but we can also explore secular avenues of exposing organs and organ music to people who aren't currently hearing it. 
Existing programs like the AGO's Pipe Organ Encounters, or another program, Orgle Kids, already do just that. However, these programs usually rely on churches to recommend students and to sponsor activities. While I think there are many avenues that expanding the secular reach of the organ could take, with my limited remaining time, I want to share some of my research related to the organ and former church buildings. Adaptive reuse former church buildings in the U.S. have become performance venues, museums, restaurants, community and cultural centers, apartments, offices, educational facilities, brew pubs, storage spaces, coffee shops, art galleries, tourism offices, nightclubs, charities, historical societies, addiction recovery centers, recording studios, retail space, and undoubtedly many others. Some of these revitalized buildings still have organs, while others have been sold, forgotten, or thrown away. Without dwelling, I want to provide several examples of how organs are used in these former church spaces. In St. Paul, Minnesota, the Summit Center was originally St. Paul's Church on the Hill, built in 1912. The developer who now owns the building rents the facility to the St. Paul Conservatory of Music, which is an independent organization which offers music lessons on a variety of instruments. The building is home to a Wix organ, which is rarely used but functioned for a local AGO event in 2019. Father John's Brewery in Bryan, Ohio serves food and drinks out of the converted basement and outdoor space. The former sanctuary, which is largely unchanged, houses a two-manual William Johnson & Son organ from 1896. They do not use the organ, but money is slowly being raised to restore it. The castle in Beloit, Wisconsin is a multi-purpose event space with a focus on hosting weddings. The sanctuary space has a modified Henry Pilcher's son's organ originally from 1910, which is used upon request at weddings. In addition, they have hosted at least one silent film accompanied by the organ. Their building also houses the Castle Conservatory of Music, which is geared toward children and offers low-priced lessons on several instruments. However, this does not include the organ. Epsilon Spires in Brattleboro, Vermont, was originally built as the First Baptist Church in 1868. The large sanctuary space is home to a three-manual SD organ originally built in 1906. In their own words, Epsilon Spires, Inc. is a center of communication, illuminating the relationships between creative arts, natural sciences, and sustainability using multimedia platforms. They are highly interested in using the organ and have hosted many performances, including my own, in December 2019. The most common use of the organ in these and other secularized spaces is as an instrument for weddings. But some of the arts venues use the organ much more liberally for concerts and other artistic presentations. With these and many other venues, the problem is not their willingness to present the organ to their communities. In fact, many of them are immensely proud of their instruments. The problem is that despite productive and positive uses of the organ in former churches, these efforts provide significantly less exposure to local communities than does the regular attendance at weekly worship services. While it is probably a stretch to imagine a secular venue providing the same degree of exposure to the community as a church, the secular venues reach a wider range of the community, Christians and non-Christians alike. But beyond increasing the frequency of events where the organ is used, I think one of the most productive and meaningful efforts we can make is to work with the owners of former churches to begin providing more educational programs related to the organ. While several of the venues I mentioned, and many more that I did not, enthusiastically include the organ, none of them have sufficient educational programs. With encouraging the implementation of educational programs, we would be cultivating new interest in the organ and perhaps creating new organists, while also increasing the frequency of events. The solution to this educational gap cannot be solved with national efforts, but whether but rather, they require the action of local organists and those passionate about the organ. First, we need to contact these venues and work with them to create opportunities for teaching traditional lessons in their facilities. Second, we should encourage regular programs for exploring how organs work, its history, and anything else we can think of. In my experience, people are generally fascinated with what lies inside of a pipe organ, and we can capitalize on this. Third, we should encourage these venues to work toward larger projects like founding organ academies for youth and local adults. Depending on the situation, this might involve founding something independent or working within the confines of existing structures like the AGO's pipe organ encounters.
To empower organists to do this tough advocacy work, I propose that we develop a database of known secularized churches with organs and an online discussion board and research page to encourage dialogue. While secularization presents the most serious issue the organ has ever faced in the United States, through localized efforts and activism, we have the opportunity to keep the culture we have while also bringing the organ to a diverse population of people of different social and religious backgrounds. We can't let ourselves lose sight of the real issue. We can sustain well-funded, well-attended programs at churches and secular institutions across the country, but if we fail to address smaller organs and smaller facilities at the community level, the organ's relevance in the 21st century will continue to wane. Let's come together and innovate. Thank you.